cannons mm -hmm. uh, by placing sacrificial anodes to the guns themselves with the idea that they would deteriorate and not the cannons and they could actually reverse this uh, process that's going on. But since all the cannons are going to be coming up mm -hmm. soon, it's been really more of an experimental process than, yeah. than just, you know, if you're going to leave them out there forever, then, then yeah, that might be a good idea to, to really pursue that. So that's the future that it will all be coming out? Mm -hmm, that's yeah. the plan, yeah. yeah. About, I guess in 2006 we made the decision that the site was threatened, mm -hmm. uh, particularly by major storm events like the hurricanes that keep coming up the coast. And, and in that shallow inlet environment, uh, the site becomes exposed. It's now resting on a very hard, compact layer of sand. Whereas in the past, the sand would come out to the inlet and build up these shoals, and, and it would be buried under maybe 10 or 12 feet of sand. Uh, since they started maintaining the fixed channel back in the 1930s, taking that sand offshore has depleted this ebb tide delta. So you can look, over, look at charts from the 1930s to the present, you see it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah. And, and now there's no deeper that the wreck can go because of this hard layer of sand yeah. that it's on. How much of the actual hull of the ship have you guys raised and how much do you have yet to go? There's uh, uh, not that much of the hull left, uh, maybe about the length of this room and, and half of this room. Uh, and, and probably two-thirds of that we brought up back in 2000. Uh, the rest of it is sitting underneath a mound of anchors and cannons and ballast stones. It will come up when that mound gets moved. Like say in 2006, the decision was made to recover everything, which is really unprecedented in underwater archaeology, particularly in, in North Carolina, uh, because of the huge effort that's involved in, in storage and conservation once you get this material up. Uh, but because of the historical significance of, of this ship, Queen Andrew Vange, and its association with Blackbeard, uh, and, and its threat from the environment, we felt like this one had to come up. So since 2006, we've been putting in a series of grid squares, five by five foot squares, starting on the south end of the site, and literally just sweeping over the entire site, and a little over 50% of the way there now. And it's hindered by the fact that we're finding not only things like cannons and anchors that you can obviously see, but uh, almost microscopic specks of gold dust, uh, fragments and, and whole uh, glass beads that were trade beads, uh, lead shot by the hundreds of thousands. And so we're having to sift through all this sand uh, to find all these small artifacts because we don't want to leave anything behind. And of course you have to keep up with the, with the uh, exact location of where it came from to keep the context, which is interesting if you plot out the gold dust, for example, that we found. Uh, on the squares of where it's come from, you can pretty much trace it right back to this one source uh, where somebody obviously left a, a bag of gold dust when they abandoned the ship and it's since it scattered out. And why did, they, uh, why did they leave a lot of stuff behind? It seems like the cannons and all that would be uh, beneficial if they were moving to another boat. Well, they, they yeah, had four vessels when they came in here, the Queen Anne's Revenge being the largest, the, the flagship, uh, mounting as, as many as 40 guns three smaller sloops, and Queen Anne's Revenge and one of the sloops both ran aground. Uh, but, but they had guns on the other boats, and I think they were, it was because of the environment offshore there, it was just too hard to unload those large Transfer. things. Right. But probably most of the smaller things they could carry, they, they were able to get off. And there's some speculation, some so actually accusations by some of the crew that Blackbeard intentionally grounded the ship with the idea of breaking up this, this large company of pirates. And whether it's intentional or not, that's what happened. So basically just uh, 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 the ship ran aground and then they kind of took what they could and just left the ship. Is that pretty much what yeah, happened? Yeah, uh, they, they all made it safely in the inlet with the two remaining vessels. Uh, he sent some pirates, including Steve Bonnet, another pirate captain, off to Bath to receive the governor's pardon. And while Bonnet was away, Blackbeard maroon some of the remaining pirates on a nearby island in, in good pirate fashion and with a hand-picked crew and all the valuables took off from one of the remaining sloops and you know five six months later he was killed at Ocracoke so he didn't last much longer than that but while during those months he, he was calling North Carolina home okay. talking to the divers this morning they say it's a race it's a, it's a race against the clock. How come? Well, uh, we, we've been looking at this site for quite a while. It was discovered in 1996. 
and initial efforts were to go out there and just map the site, see how much was left out there, what, what is left. Uh, and we soon came to realize, particularly with all those hurricanes that we were having in the late 1990s and early 2000s, that uh, the site was threatened. It's, it's sitting on a very hard, compact layer of sand, so the material that's there, which normally would just keep getting deeper and deeper in the sand if, if it, as the water got deeper, is, is just sitting there, and as the sand is depleted uh, by these storms, it's becoming exposed. I can remember going out after Hurricane Ophelia, and we took a dive down there. It was very murky because it was still, still stirred up from the storm, and there was this brass mortar, like a mortar and pestle, just lying on the bottom exposed. You've never seen it out there, just kind of rolling back and forth with the swell, uh, which we recovered, documented it where it was, recovered it. Some years later, our excavation units got to that same area and we found the pest, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, if you weren't there to find this, this mortar, it probably would be long gone. And particularly smaller, lighter artifacts uh, tend, to, tend to wash off if they're exposed for any period of time. So how long have you been working on the project and how much time is there left to work on the project? I, I started, well, I was with the Underwater Archaeology Branch for 35 years. Uh, 1996, in November of 96, the wreck was found, and I came up the day after it was found and made a, made a dive on it. So, you know, really, since this discovery, I've been, been out there. And then over the course of the next 12, 14 years, uh, we, and, you know, we'd be out there for anywhere from two weeks to two months uh, working on the site. As far as how much time is left, it, it, you just don't know. Uh, but the decision was made in 2006 that this wreck site is too important. To, to leave there with the chance that we're going to lose additional material or maybe eventually lose all of it. So we started a project at that time to completely excavate the site, remove everything down to little tiny specks of gold dust, and uh, working our way systematically through the, through the wreck. Well, they told me they have a year left. Oh, they have a, le a year left. What happens in a year? Well, if, in a year, it would still be there, but you don't know what you're going to lose. Uh, funding is always a major concerned how long the funding will last. Uh, we right now don't receive any state funding except for salaries of our, of our staff. Okay. And so, it, so, so it's a funding issue. So it's, it's I mean, a funding is issue. It, is this, how expensive is this to keep doing? Well, we put together a budget, uh, I guess, a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, of $450,000 to carry the project through next year. And that's, and that's why and that's the money we have right now. And that money came, as I said, not from the state, but from private donations, corporate sponsors, foundations, and things like that. It's private money, so it's it's not state money. It's private money. Mm -hmm. Is there more out there? We hope so. Uh, we hope that that's the direction the project will take because not only is it going to be very expensive to get this material off the bottom into the preservation lab, but that's just the start of it. And it'll take years and years to go through that conservation process. So we're hoping to, through the Friends of Queen Anne's Revenge, uh, and working in concert with the Department of Cultural Resources, to raise this money to keep this project afloat. So to speak. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm uh -huh. great. Richard, could you say a little bit about when the shipwreck was first found, and you were here, and the excitement of what it was like when the world found out we had bikers. Mm -hmm. Um, as I mentioned, I was able to dive on the wreck the day after it was found. It was found by a team from InterSAL Incorporated, which had a permit from our office to search Beaufort Inlet. And uh, Mike Daniel was heading up that search. And I got a call from Mike one afternoon, and he said, uh, Richard, I think we found Queen Anne's Revenge, and described this site that they found with a, with a mound of cannon, about 10 cannon, two large anchors. Uh, they recovered a couple of artifacts, and I said, well, Mike, I know this is the last day you're supposed to be there, but can you wait one more day and let us come out and take a look at the site? So, oh, yeah, sure. So we went up there late November. It was a terrible day weather-wise, but we managed to get down. And we always felt like if this wreck were found, it would be buried under 10 or 15 feet of sand. But there it was exposed on the bottom, uh, as Mike described it, this mound of cannons and anchors. Uh, so it was, it was really an incredible feeling to think that this may be Queen Anne's Revenge. They had brought up some artifacts that first day, including a, a ship's bell, which is on display here in the museum. Uh, but it was concreted. You couldn't see anything on it. So we took it back to our preservation lab at Fort Fisher. And the next day, Leslie Bright, our conservator, began cleaning off this layer of concretion. And the first thing he uncovered, it looked like a number one. It could have been an I or an L, but it looked like a, a one. 
So he moved over a little bit and it was a seven. So he said, okay, this is, this is a date on this bell, which is, of course, key in, in trying to identify the wreck site. And if it had dated anywhere past 1718, then obviously this would not be Queen Anne's Revenge. But the next digit happened to be a zero and then a, then a uh, three, 1703. So, or 1705, I'm sorry. Uh, so we knew that we were certainly in the right neighborhood. Uh, we brought up a barrel from the brass London bus. Uh, the number of cannon we'd seen on the site really ruled out anything historically that we knew about uh, that had sunk in Beaufort Inlet. And I guess that was in November, and finally in March of the next year, uh, 1997, uh, Governor Hunt made the announcement that this wreck had been found and that we were 90% sure that this was Queen Anne's Revenge. And it was just instant uh, attention. We were getting phone calls from South Africa and Australia and Europe and papers and TV stations throughout this country. Uh, I got to be on Good Morning America the next day showing the bell and some of these artifacts. And really the, the fascination with the shipwreck project and with Blackbeard is not diminished. I mean, people are still fascinated by Blackbeard. If you were to ask a person to identify or name a pirate, uh, the average person on the street, probably the first one to come to mind would be Blackbeard. And the fact that we had Blackbeard's flagship just a mile off our North Carolina coast, uh, it's, it's just an incredible opportunity for us. What are some of the artifacts uh, you guys have, co have recovered? It seems like you have a little bit of everything here on display. The uh, artifacts range in size from, like I said, little specks of gold dust to uh, the cannons and anchors. Uh, that would be the biggest things. Uh, and what's interesting, a lot of the artifacts are locked up in this concretion where you have an iron object and, it, and through this deterioration, it catches up sand and shells, but also the other order, other artifacts, uh, sometimes organic material uh, like rope. Uh, we found lots of medical instruments. We know that when Blackbeard blockaded the port of Charleston just a week before he lost the ship, uh, he demanded for the release of the hostages he took a chest of medicine to be delivered to the ship. Uh, whether these instruments are from that chest, we can't say, but. Uh, uh, some interesting things, and including a urethral syringe that would have been used for the treatment of venereal disease. It's a pretty lethal looking uh, piece of uh, medical equipment. Uh, the, the mortar and pestle I mentioned that would be used for making compounds. Uh, and just about anything you can think of that you would have on board a ship, to live on board a ship. Uh, pewter plates and platters, bottles, uh, wine glasses, uh, as well as the everyday things that are used to operate the ship. I asked you before too, but some of the uh, timeline as far as there needs to be a hurry funding wise, what about the status of the wreck? You know, it, it, uh, it, it comes and goes in terms of the amount of exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, a few, few years ago it was completely exposed to the elements. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we did at that time working with the Corps of Engineers was to put some sand offshore of the wreck that they were dredging out of the channel here at Beaufort create a mound that would sort of replenish the sand and, and cover the wreck, and, and that has helped. Uh, the wreck is now more buried than it was at that time, but as, as you know, if you've studied uh, beach dynamics and beach towns, the sand that they put out doesn't last forever, so, so we feel like that was just a temporary measure, and, and the material needs to come up and be safely in the lab, and, uh, and then eventually conserved and put on display. What was the wreck not found for so long? Was it simply covered up, or did people forget where it was lost? Or? Uh, it was not found, I would say, because uh, yeah, people were not looking for it. This, this group, Intersal, reissued them a permit, I believe, in 1987. Uh, originally, they were looking for a Spanish ship called El Salvador. And then through the research that Phil Masters conducted uh, and the information we provided him, he realized that Queen Anne's Revenge and the Sloop Adventure would also be in the search area. But they had funding issues as well. They weren't able to get out very much or very often, and it wasn't until 1996 that they finally put together a project where they were out there with uh, the instrumentation that allowed them to locate the site. And you mentioned earlier some speculation as to what happened to the ship. Uh, it, maybe it was grounded intentionally and maybe maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it, def it definitely ran aground. Uh, some of the pirates that were later captured and put on trial in Charleston said that Blackbeard rounded it intentionally. Uh, in order to break up this large company of pirates, that were anywhere from maybe three to four hundred pirates under his command, but that had gotten unwieldy, and he didn't want to keep split the loot amongst this many people. Uh, one of the interesting things we found, though, about 300 yards south of the wreck, which would be out towards the deeper water, towards the ocean, there's an anchor that dates to the very same time period, same style, 
uh, set with the, the shank of the anchor pointing right at the ship. And there's a ring on the end of the shank and the ring's pointing right at the ship. So it, it looks like this may have been what they called a kedge anchor that would have been put offshore uh, with a line and, and then around the uh, capstan or windlass to try to pull the ship off after it grounded. Uh, can't say that for sure. And if, if that is, is, is that an indication that he was trying to get it off or maybe he was just trying to save face? Uh, it's, it's hard to hard to interpret something 300 years ago. And he was, uh, you said earlier he was killed a, a few months later? Yeah, this was uh, in June of 1718, uh, November of 1718, he was killed in battle uh, at Ocracoke, just up the coast. And he was on board the, the Adventure at that point? Or? Yeah, and there's some confusion about that because the sh other ship that he lost here was a sloop called Adventure. And there was a unnamed Spanish sloop that they captured off the coast of Cuba uh, that, that we think is what he left Beaufort on. So did he rename it Adventure? Did he have the, the papers from the original Adventure and that made it advantageous or he just liked the name Adventure? But, but the accounts of the Battle at Ocracoke do name the sloop he was on as Adventure. How deep is the wreck? The wreck is about 24 feet deep, uh, so not really not very deep at all. And uh, Richard, how many times did you dive on the wreck itself? I would be hard pressed, but uh, hundreds and hundreds, I would is say. It, is it pretty hard to see down there? It seems like the visibility is pretty low. Is it? Visibility varies quite a bit. Uh, on, on good days, there have been days when, when I've dropped off the boat and looked down, and you can see the site spread out below you, so you have over 20 feet of visibility. Uh, typically, you have maybe four or five feet, which is not bad. Uh, sometimes, with the falling tide, Especially if it's been stormy, you'll get a lot of sediment in the water and you might just see a few inches. Uh, when you guys bring uh, items up, how, how long is it after you, know, you bring those up that you can actually see what you're looking at? You mentioned the bell earlier and, mm -hmm. and you guys are working on some cannons. Is it a couple of years? or? or? Yeah, some, some things, of course, you can recognize right off what it is. Others are locked up in this concretion. And one of the techniques that the lab uses quite a bit is, is x-ray. It's just like a medical x-ray, but x-ray these concretions, and then you can see the outline of the artifacts and have an idea of what's in there, how you might attack this concretion, because you have to chip away at it with, a, with an air scribe to remove it very carefully. Uh, sometimes, particularly with iron, the original artifact is completely deteriorated, and what you have is a void inside that you can use uh, an epoxy casting material to, to recreate the artifact that way. And it, and it depends on the material as to how long the process takes. Uh, glass, ceramics, uh, brass, bronze, cop copper alloy material is relatively, relatively quick. Uh, you know, may, maybe a matter of months or a year. Things like a cannon, uh, where you're trying not only to remove this concretion, but to get the chlorides, to get the salts out of this iron. Because if you don't, it, the salts are going to crystallize and, and it'll just fall apart. Uh, something like a can, it might take up to five years in, in an electrolysis process. Uh, last question for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, at what point did you guys know that this was Blackbeard ship? Was there like an aha moment? Or, or there was it... no one moment. Uh, yeah. We kept looking for the smoking blunderbuss that would, would prove that's what it was. But, but even, as I say, on that first, first day, the, the, uh, the first dive, because of the number of the cannon, the apparent age of the, of the shipwreck, which was confirmed when we got the date, date off this bell, uh, we felt, and, and, the, and the size of the site was, it was, this was a large ship and not typical at all of vessels that were plying these waters in the early 1700s. Uh, and then we had no record except for the adventure of the smaller sloop that he lost, and, and we had too many cannons for this to be that. But uh, yeah, we were in the, in the 90 percentile certainty that this was Queen Andrew Vanish. So and everything that we've recovered since continues to confirm that. Uh, we got another cannon with the date of 1713, uh, part of a, a wine glass that was made to commemorate the coronation of King George the first about 1716. Uh, Queen Anne's uh, coin weight uh, with Queen Anne's image on it. So everything continues to date right to this time period, nothing after 1718. So too many weapons for a merchant ship. Exactly, yeah. Right. Uh, I think we're up to 27 cannons now that have oh. been found on, on the wreck site. Oh. Okay, thanks very much Richard. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. A lot of material has been recovered off of that. Yeah. So early on, we had a, a catalog of the artifacts from the Witta site. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, if we found something we couldn't quite recognize, we would yeah. go to that catalog and say, oh, that's what that is. Yeah. 
Uh, Who is the pirate associated with the widow? The, the widow, and it's W H Y D A H, widow. Oh, okay, widow. Uh, okay. Sam Bellamy was the pirate. Okay. Black Sam Bellamy. It was around the same era, or? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking it was lost in 1717, and, and of course ours was 1718. Actually, mm -hmm. very similar history. It was an a English slave ship that was captured uh, by English pirates, hmm. by, by Bellamy, uh, and, and used, it, and it retained its original name, which Witta is, is one variation of the spelling of, of Judah, which was a, or, or Wida, which is a uh, port in West Africa, uh, and that's where Queen Anne's Revenge, or La Concorde, had been coming from uh, on this on this last slave trading voyage. Okay. And uh, uh, how long was the ship used by French traders before Blackbeard started using it? The ship was built sometime probably around 1709, uh, and at that time Queen Anne's War was in, in process, the War of Spanish Succession, uh, primarily between England and, and Spain. And uh, or in, I'm sorry, England and, and France. The uh, Le Concorde was used as a privateer, which would be a privately owned vessel engaged by the government to prey on merchant ships of the enemy. So it was a French privateer. Took a voyage down West African coast over to the Caribbean, 1709, 1710, uh, capturing uh, ships of England or, or its allies. Came back to France to the port of Nantes. Uh, it was owned by a, a merchant named Rene Montaudoin. And uh, the war ended shortly thereafter, so he then switched from being a privateer to uh, using it for a slave ship. And they have we have records of voyages in 1713, 1715, and then finally its third voyage. I believe he left not in March of 1717, and then was captured in November by the pirates uh, in the Caribbean. So did Blackbeard himself name it, or was that the name that, that was on their the, way? The name, the original name of the ship was La Concorde, as a, as a French vessel. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the pirates took it over and made it their flagship, they renamed it Queen Anne's Revenge. Uh, I'm sure Blackbeard had a part in that renaming. Uh, probably because uh, we think Blackbeard and, and, and most of these English pirates served as privateers, English privateers, during Queen Anne's War. So you can look at it either as Queen Anne's Revenge, because he, here's a French, former French privateer that we've captured and uh, are renaming, or perhaps thumbing their nose at the uh, King George and the uh, the new monarchy in, in England, which was the, the Hanoverians that had taken over from uh, Queen, Anne, Queen Anne, who was the last of the Stuarts. So they were maybe thumbing their nose at all authority at that time. Yeah, uh, kind of a good name for a pirate ship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, the folks here in Beaufort and Morgan City keep a very close eye on the site. I bet. Uh, you know, the charter, dive charter operators and the fishing operators, they know where the wreck is. Uh, in fact, we had one day, we went out just for a day day trip to the site, and next thing we knew, the Coast Guard showed up, and they wanted to know who we were and uh, what we were doing out there. And, you know, once we convinced them that we worked for the state and were supposed to be there, it was fine. It was, it was great to see that kind of response. Now, I haven't been out to it, so I don't know the exact location, but have you found that there's been any kind of cultural story record of it? Like, people around here knew, no, they knew no, that it was around no, there? No, yeah. people, people always say, well, I've been in and out of that inlet thousand times and gone right over it yeah. and never knew it was there. Yeah. But it's probably been buried for, for most of its history. Yeah. And it's just now because of the endless dynamics and, and the dredging, uh, removing the sand that will normally replenish that peptide delta uh, and the storms that we've had that it's staying exposed. Can you name a storm that, that probably was one of the, the, the things that uncovered it? Her, Hurricane Fran yeah. it certainly it was discovered right after Hurricane Fran. Uh, and, and when we went down on it, a after it was discovered, uh, it was, we didn't know if that was typical exposure or a lot exposed, but uh, now we realize that yes, it was very exposed. And after the storm, it, it started to cover back up. Yeah. There's this one mound of anchors and cannons that generally stays exposed above the water. Yeah. Yeah. But, but usually after the, after the big storms, after the hurricanes, the sand is scoured off the site. Mm -hmm. Include a division of artifacts, mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, looking back in the 1960s when these laws were first put on the books, and, and it was thought, well, if anybody's going to go out there and, and recover items off of a shipwreck, it's going to be for commercial interest. Mm -hmm. But the state wanted to maintain some part of the collection, so you'd have a 75% percent 
for the salver, 25% for the tape. state would be a typical split. Mm. And, and that's the way our law was set up back in 1967. Uh, today, we like to think of these things as, as cultural resources, archaeological sites that should not be commercially uh, utilized or uh, exploited. Uh, but the permit that Phil Masters and the Intersal had when they discovered the wreck gave them rights to 75% of any coins or precious metals that might be on Queen Anne's Revenge. But they realized early on that they both based both on the history uh, that didn't indicate that the pirates were capturing Spanish treasure ships mm -hmm. and also what we had seen that they didn't, they didn't leave valuables behind that they were not likely to find much in the way of I mean, you could hold the coins and precious metals that have been found on the site in your hand. So yeah. it's not as if they could fund this project, the recovery, which we would require them to do with the same level of detail that we are as archaeologists. Mm. So they relinquish their claim mm -hmm. to the artifacts, uh, any, any claim they might have, and in return ask for media rights to produce a documentary uh, and rights to make replica artifacts. Uh, so the exclusive rights to make a prep the artifacts and market those. Mm. But that agreement actually uh, expires this year. I don't, I don't know what the status of it is. In September. This summer? Next September. Next September. Next September. Are they going to remake the, cat, the, the syringe thing that you've had? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There was talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to give it to you for Christmas. Yeah, exactly. What to give the man who has everything. <laughs>